we're back. I, I, I know we said we wouldn't do this again, but deja vu, here we are. We're back to talk about more Star Trek Picard. It always starts out good. That's the trick, isn't it? Hit it, Johnny. I, I, I guess, spoiler, it, it started out good, but didn't I say that about last season? We said we wouldn't be back. Uh, seasons one and two were a literal nightmare. A fever dream. A fever nightmare. Yeah, yeah. Something you just want to forget about, like a past traumatic incident yeah. that you want like a, a therapist to help you bury. I'm having the strangest memory. But... Here we have season three of Picard, and almost predictably after season two, they made a very smart and sharp course correction into dumping half that cast. Nothing against those actors. Uh, Captain Rios, uh, Alison Girardi, our favorite Elnor. Oh God, I forgot Elnor existed. I literally forgot Elnor existed. I was gonna say, not half the cast, we still got Raffi and Seven, but yeah, Elnor's a thing. Elnor, and don't forget about uh, I Isa Brones, who played uh, the robot girl. Oh, I've got, I forgot she existed. <laughs> she, she didn't have a huge part in season two, but she was the, the focus of season one. Her and her twin sister, remember? I was just, I was just thinking Rio and, Rios and Girardi are gone, but you're right. There, there was a cast. You're right, there was a cast. <laughs> there was a cast. Uh, they wanted Picard and a bunch of uh, misfits, I guess, to fly around the galaxy and have uh, non Starfleet s adventures. And everyone's like, no. So, Star Trek Picard season one, uh, let's test our memory. Captain Picard. How did it... Has to go on a mission, he, and, and the Starfleet Admiral tells him to go f*** himself. Yes. He finds a ship piloted by drunken Captain Rios, a Starfleet reject, who quits Starfleet because he watched his captain murder benevolent androids because he was given an order to. Uh, they, oh, they fi find Dr. Allison Girardi, who murders... Uh, the, uh, the guy from Measure of the Man, um, uh, Bruce Maddox. Mm -hmm. and, and then there's something about androids. They're trying to find the mystery of the twin androids. The, the Romulan psychic women cult has an artifact that's a beacon that androids can broadcast to the android dimension brings in where androids monster. will come into our reality and yes. murder everybody. So there's a, there's a, there's a, and man so we need to murder all androids. Yes. There's a, there's a, 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 a Manson cult, a, 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 a hale Bob comic cult that lives on a hippie planet made of androids run by Noonien Soong's great, great, great grandson. And he's telling the androids that we can have, the, the universe can be a great place. We just have to eliminate all life forms that aren't synthetic. And then, and then there's Romulans and a Borg cube. And then we meet uh, Hugh is in it. Why? That's season one. Yeah, no, yes, yeah. yes. And, and then there's some battling uh, uh, that the, the, the Elnor has a sword and there's some fighting. And then there's there's one dimensional villain lady who is in love with her own brother. Who may may actually be the worst villain ever written. Is she is that like a, a literal fact? Is she the worst villain ever written? <laughs> She's pretty uh, one dimensional. Uh, and then that's at the, giving her too many dimensions, Mike. Then at the end, Picard is dead because they go up and the androids have released hippie space flowers into space that battle Romulan fleet. And then Picard dies of a heart-related condition and then they bring him down to the planet and then they save him by resurrecting him in synthetic life form. Form. Uh, and, but still make him an old man with a limit of age to where he'll die at his normal life death age. <sighs> <sighs> it's, it's telling, 
that this took us like 15 minutes to give the summary. I'm surprised I remember as much as I did. Yeah. Then season two was the, uh, the the first contact kind of Borg thing where Borgs went back in time and changed the past to turn the Federation into like a, almost like a, a mirror mirror universe where everyone's evil. It's like, it's not quite that. It's fascist humanity. But yeah, they don't call it the, um, uh, what do they call it in the mirror universe? The, the oh God. Terran Empire? Terran Empire! I think it's just the Terran Empire. Oh, and then they crash land the ship at Picard's vineyard, which is now run down. Uh, the opening is Picard wakes up in his in his chateau, and he's got all the skulls of all of his conquered victims. He's like an evil general. Yeah. He's killed Gul Dukat and all the famous skulls. And he misses his mummy. And his mummy. His mummy. His mummy has mental problems and kills herself, and this traumatizes a young Picard. Yes. And then Picard famously, at the end, says, my mother hung herself. My mother hung herself here in this place. Anyway, we recap seasons one and two of Picard. And none um, of it seems to matter. I, and we didn't even talk about Guinan and her 10 forward bar. Her shotgun. And her shotgun, her nasty 10 forward bar. Oh, and her magic Q summoning bottle. Her magic Q summoning bottle that shakes the room because she's... She... And how inbred are the Sung family? How inbred must they be? They all look the same. Yeah. And there's never a wife around that has, or a, uh, let's say a maternal figure, grandmother, uh, mother, grandparent, who has pr apparently progenized these offsprings. Is it is it can, is it canon that the Sungs are continually cloning themselves? It it should be. That would make sense. They, they clone themselves. That's why all their descendants are identical, and they're so narcissistic. Even their androids have to look exactly the same too. Is this, a, is this canon? Uh, I, well, see, that's that's the thing. Is the slate can be wiped relatively clean. I don't know if you can. Uh, reverse con, uh, retcon, the idea that Picard is an android. I see. It was never brought up in the first episode, and that's what we're here to talk about today, is the first episode. And you may have noticed that our, our, our thumbnail for this episode is us looking relatively happy. And the thumbnails for previous Star Trek Picards just degrade and get worse and worse and worse. Hopefully, that won't happen. Hopefully, you say hopefully, but that's, that's been the pattern with New Trek, is when you do your, your season long mystery arcs, and it's okay early on when you, you, the story still might go somewhere, but then it never does. But I can't make that judgment on season three yet. We've got one episode in the can, and so far I'm okay with it. It's like starting up your car for a cross-country road trip. <laughs> We're driving from Milwaukee to California. What could happen? <laughs> could go real smoothly. You could, have, you could have a great time. You listen to Life is a Highway. You have a great drive. Stop at a couple of cool places. Have a nice uh, couple nights in some, some hotels along the way and then arrive safely at your destination. Or much worse things can happen. Flat tire during a rainstorm in front of a spooky mansion. And that trip goes bad real quick. Parking lot robbery, uh, food poisoning, uh, encounter inclement weather, death. Of course not. Are you? This season feels really special. So, Rich, what do you know about Star Trek Picard season three so far from behind the scenes perspectives? Like, I have not followed anything closely. Well, I think the most noteworthy thing is a new showrunner. He's the showrunner. He wrote the first episode, 
presumably other episodes I don't know yet, um, but I know the, the specter, the looming evil specter of, of Kurtzman, Goldsman, and all the previous producers, while on the credits, I'm pretty sure they're not involved, or at least I hope they're not. Well, we'll I, I think it'll become quickly obvious whether or not they're involved if like the subsequent episodes, if like the story goes nowhere and just rambles and ends in a car wreck. Then we'll know they're all still involved. Yes. But as it is, it does feel like they've gone in a new direction because they're, at least episode one, they're doing something very specific. And, and what episode one is, is Star Trek The Wrath of Khan, the TV series. Yes. Yes, there is a, a very obvious inspiration for both Wrath of Khan and uh, Search for Spock and Undiscovered Country. Now, at this point, I kind of know I will never get my beloved Star Trek TV series back right. where a bunch of competent explorers encounter ethical dilemmas and interesting scientific phenomena. I know that's dead, but I'll, 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 I'll accept it if I can get Star Trek The Motion Pictures back. That's something. That's, that's the point I wanted to make, is that I think we had, we had like a horrific allergic re reaction to Star Trek Picard seasons one and two. Because we're just like, ah, uh, it's, it's so an antithetical of what Next Gen was, where it was like, you know, obviously it's now pointless to even try to, to argue for episodic storylines, even though I guess they happen in Brave New World. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> um, uh, it, it's like, that's done. That kind of storytelling's done. It's a, it's a whole season arc. Now my, my particular view on this is, the original series was obviously episodic. Kirk, Spock, McCoy. Yeah. Episodic. When they got to movies, with the exception of Star Trek The Motion Picture, which was one big, long episode of Star Trek. And I actually like it quite a bit. Yes, of I, course. I, I so wanted to be on the review for that, but that is... That's fine. Maybe we could do another one where we talk yeah, about fine. it again. It's fine. I'm sorry I didn't invite you for that. It's okay. Uh, but then once you hit Star Trek II, then it becomes... A, a whole different beast. Yeah. It's it's uh, Wrath, of, it's Wrath of Khan is not my favorite. Surprisingly, everyone loves Wrath of Khan. I think it's pretty good. I don't love it, but it's a fun movie. And the, and I think in my head, the the series, uh, you know, the old Star Trek shows, even up to Voyager, were all sort of like lower budgeted shows. They had the one set. They couldn't do a lot vis with visual effects that, was, that weren't expensive at the time. So they, they, they wrote smaller scale stories, you know, ones that just took place on the ship only. Mm -hmm. ah, we're gonna talk, we're gonna talk in this room now, we're gonna go talk in this room. And from an intellectual standpoint, that's what made them fascinating because the writers were forced to write good stories that focused mostly on dialogue and, and theoretical problems, dilemmas or moral conflicts or whatever. Ethical conflict. With the added constraint is you just can't have the crew members yelling at each other. Sure, there's that, but then you you can't also just have like they 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 squeezed in their fair amount of action and space battles and whatnot as as often as they could, but you, they were doing uh, 27 episodes in a season, you know, shooting quickly, uh, efficiently, trying to save money on budget, making a big long show, and then this is 10 episodes, and um, it's basically now, I've, I've transitioned it into thinking of it as a movie. This feels like the start of a proper Star Trek The Next Generation feature film. Which we never really got either. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Star Trek Generations was a, a soiled diaper. <laughs> um, <laughs> Star Trek... Uh, Everyone loves First Contact, but I just think that movie is so fucking stupid. It's, it's a dumb action movie. Star Trek Insurrection is the closest thing to a two-parter TNG uh, movie. Yeah. And then you get to Nemesis, which was just a big downer. And then they're, then they're like, well, st the, the, the one thing about Star Trek um, uh, Insurrection is that it wasn't like 
a a revenge plot. Like I'm ba I'm bad guy who wants revenge. And it's just that's just getting so tiring. And that's the one thing that has me nervous about this is um, Amanda Plummer is the villain, and I don't know if you know who that no. is. She's the daughter of Christopher Plummer. Okay. Who recently okay. passed away. He played the bald uh, Klingon villain in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. He's okay. He's a famous actor who's been in a million other yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. But that's, uh, that's who he is. So Amanda Plummer's in this, and uh, you know, she's got like a Ed Grimley haircut, and she's got a scar on her face, and she looks like, she looks like Frau Farbissina from the, I'm like, that's your villain? I haven't, I haven't seen this it's yet. It's in the trailer. But the, the feature films were always about uh, fun and adventure. And, and the interesting thing is, in my opinion, Kirk, Bones, Spock, they transferred over to the films seamlessly. They didn't feel like different characters. Mm -hmm. You know, you could, uh, Uhura, Chekhov, you know, Sulu, they, uh, Scotty, they're all the same characters. But all of them really transferred over to the feature films. Kirk, Kirk lends himself well to being an action hero. Yes. Picard does not, which is why, probably smartly, they have instantly teamed him up with Riker, who was basically Kirk, but a second officer. Yeah, when, the, when it came time for the TNG films, n none of those characters really felt right in sort of action roles, with, I guess, the exception of Worf. Yeah. Who took out a purple space bazooka <laughs> for <laughs> some reason. No, 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 we're gonna, we talk about episode, you want to, I want to talk about like just the visual things. For okay, the let's, let's get into Star Trek Picard season three, episode one. It starts okay. off, and I think it says, What's the first line? It's like uh, I just remember it started off like the Shawshank Redemption. We had, was it the same music as the start of the Shawshank Redemption? What the f are you talking? about? They got the gramophone music going on. I don't want to set. Oh the yeah yeah yeah. Picard's listening to his space gramophone because it's got blue lights on it. Well, that's no, that's in his house. Yeah. But they, they do play the old-timey song, um, I want to start the world on fire. It's, it's playing in space as they come into Beverly Crusher's oh, that's right. spacecraft. She's playing a Picard playlist that he made for her of old-timey songs. Picard, coincidentally, is also playing that in his chateau. Okay. But uh, yeah, the, credit, the credits look very Wrath of Khan. It's got that star field that's moving. I think it says in the 23rd century or but the font, the look of the, the star field slowly moving is very retro. And then we, we see Beverly Crusher on a very small starship called the Helios, mm -hmm. which I'll talk about in a minute because I wanted to talk about the inconsistency of the size of their shuttlecraft that de attaches to the back of the Helios to the size of the Helios bridge. <laughs> It was weird. The Helios <laughs> looks like a full-size starship, and, the, and the, you can even see the bridge dome, and there's little windows in it. And then their shuttlecraft, which is a small, like, it's like a Type 9 shuttlecraft from, like, Voyager. It's very small, and it attaches to the back, and then the bridge is, like, this big, and the shuttlecraft's, like, this big. And I was like, that bridge could fit. It's, like, the size of a port john <laughs> I was very confused. But I guess that's just Beverly Crusher's small private starship, apparently. Yeah. Uh, but she's rocking the Kirk Wrath of Khan jacket. It's got like the white collar yes. thing going on. Kirk's got the red one with the big, yeah, the big white um, uh, open collar, like 70s style. And, and Beverly Crusher's wearing that. So I was like, like that. Um, she's on a ship and there's a, the, the camera pans around bunch of member berries, there, there, there's a lot of that in this. Mm -hmm. They're really trying to uh, really make you feel that next gen vibe as, as hard and as, as much as they can in this horribly ugly and dark and depressing world of New Trek. They're not, they're, it's not a next gen vibe. They're totally going for a that kind of early motion picture Star Trek vibe. Let's call it a blend. The, the, it pans around and we see, uh, the first thing they show is like a deep cut member berry. 
and it's um, plant, uh, plants. It's a plant. And it's, it's the exact same kind of plant that Beverly Crusher was pruning in, um, you know, the episode where the ship yeah. explodes numerous times? And that, that's the, the, she's like pruning this special plant when she hears all the, the voices. Um, come, she thinks it's like a com communications error. Uh, so they show that. So she's like still pruning that same kind of plant. And then they pan over, there's some kind of award. I couldn't read the name on it, but then it has a, a suitcase that says Jack Crusher's belongings. And I'm like, okay. And, and for some reason the Picard uh, best of both worlds things playing on a computer monitor. I yeah, yeah, I thought that was weird. I don't know what that was about. Um, it might have to tie in with, with Halbert and the, uh, the communications. This word, Halbert, I have no idea what it means. Uh, which comes up later. We'll see. The, you remember the, the, the secret... Um, the code, the encoding we had the, to the, encode. The virus, the You don't the know about it because you, you weren't were with us at the yeah, time. Yeah, the, the, the Borg put in a code into the uh, Enterprise computer systems that added a th random three into all the numbers to screw up their navigations. So maybe she was watching that to like download that code to prepare her, uh, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> or it was just, hey, remember best of both worlds? What a great time. And then, then we learned that the stun setting on her phaser is broken. Does it say that? No, <laughs> I just thought like, like they're going for the motion, they're going for the movie vibe, I get it. So it's just instant vaporization, but come on, she's a doctor. I think they were, go well, they, they referenced that. Riker's like, look, oh my God, look at this. Yeah. It looks like a spontaneous human combustion victim. It, it vaporized to ash and Picard's like, Beverly would only do that if, you know, she felt like she was in real danger. And clearly she's fucking terrified when the bird monsters board the ship because they mean business. So she locks her son away, who we later learn is her son, behind a wall to protect him and she starts doing the phaser thing and then the birds, I guess, don't finish her off. They just leave, I don't know what happens. Which, which, which is another Wrath of Khan thing. Here's the son you didn't know you had. And that's, that's the tease. It may not actually end up being his Picard's son, but the tease is, look Picard, you got a son you didn't know about. Well, that actor, his name's Ed Spellers, Spielers. A uh, British guy who was on like, Downton Abbey and a bunch of other stuff, but uh, on IMDb, his name his name doesn't have a character credit, so it's still mystery. Yeah. Uh, I have a theory, uh, given that we saw the Jack Crusher thing. I think he's a clone of Jack Crusher. Kind of looks like the actor that played him in the Wesley Holodeck experience. That's a very interesting theory. I mean... It's a little weird. It's just, it's an interesting idea. I don't know, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. Like I why didn't. show the Jack Crusher luggage unless she was pulling DNA from it? Just this is, this is Crusher's space. She's got his look, she's got his stuff. It could be That's a son. how I interpreted that. It could be a son from a different, uh, why would she still have Jack Crusher's stuff? Because. It's her private starship. Because. They, there's things they know about Who Beverly Crusher. Who gets a Crusher. private starship? Beverly Crusher, apparently. She's become violent and evil. Maybe she she's stole it. She's not evil. It. She's doing some kind of research, but it's so dark she can't see what research she's doing. So she accidentally cloned her dead husband. That's just a guess. Our guesses usually are wrong with this because it just goes off the fucking rails. Right, right. Okay, so then let's uh, let's move on. Uh, so Chateau Picard. We, we go to Chateau Picard. Uh, he's packing up member berries to put in a museum. They really, they're really harping on the Enterprise D, which is fine. Uh, that seems a little fan servicey. I'm okay with that. Um, they show the Enterprise D painting, the famous one that hung in his uh, ready room. And then uh, there's breakers at a bar and there's a bunch of, it's like Fleet, Fleet Week. Uh, uh, Frontier Day. Frontier Day. And then there's like little, little tokens of Enterprise D and nobody nobody wants them. They, they keep talking about Enterprise D. Picard in Next Gen Time, Times was in his prime. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was in charge of the starship. Um, he was a very guarded man. He, he was 
he, he didn't let his feelings out. He didn't let people in very often. Um, and there was a very specific way that he would speak and give orders and all that. When I watched the first two seasons of Picard, I was like, oh, this, uh, this, uh, he's too like wistful and emotional and, and it doesn't feel right. And, and with this, it, felt, it feels like a better balance was struck between what he was 40 years ago now um, and what he is at 85. Larry, these things from my past, they are so dear to me. They're mementos of dear friends. What we leave behind is not as important as how we've lived. I am not a man who needs a legacy, but I took some comfort from the fact that the, the family would go on. But now there'll be no more Picards. Mm -hmm. People change over long periods of time, and maybe he did become a little bit more wistful and, and emotional or I'm, I'm fine retrospective, with his, I guess. I'm fine with his character changing. I think the problem with me, though, is just when he says his lines, it's not even that they sound wistful, they just sound kind of flat. Okay, okay. But, I mean, the acting part's fine. It's, yeah. it's, to me, it's like, there was one line that he said, um, uh, Laris is asking him about uh, his relationship with Crusher, right? She's like, yeah, Dr. Crusher, Beverly Crusher, yes, you tried to have a relationship with her. And, and then he says, tried is the operative word. <laughs> tried is the operative word. That sounded Picard. I could just hear him saying that as a younger man. Yeah. Kind of like just giving a little bit, but kind of being clinical or cold about it. Instead, it, uh, seasons two or one, Picard would have said, we were connected in a way I've never been connected with another person before. But in the drifts of time, sometimes <laughs> these souls do part swiftly and softly. And softly. But and lest we not forget the times we had together, for they enrich us. Our souls were intertwined, but never quite able to find the bond that we ultimately could not share within oh. ourselves. And he goes, tried is the operative word. And oh, it's like, I'll, that's Picard. I'll grant you it's written better. And so uh, he's a little wistful, that's fine, he's, he's old. My, my question is, does everybody forget about the Enterprise E? Yes, it sucked. Did they ever say what happened to the Enterprise E? No. Did you, just, did you just get, you know what? I'm fine if it just got quietly decommissioned. So we left Nemesis. This is why I like the Picard Riker relationship in season three of Picard. Because remember the last time we saw Riker and Marina Sirtis, AKA Deanna Troy? Picard comes down to their happy pizza making uh, 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 cabin uh, planet uh -huh. in the woods. <laughs> Back to our discussion. Picard beams down to Happy Planet where Riker, Troy, and their daughter, Kessler? Kessler? That was Kelsey, but I could Kels be wrong. Kelsler? Kelso? Kelso? <laughs> Is it Kelso? <laughs> Something. They buy, they land down and she's like, uh, and then, oh, Picard's like, Come here, and, they, and then, then they all like, they, they embrace and hugs, and it's just like love, love. It's a, Pac, I love you, I love you. And, and remember Picard, when Riker left for the Titan at the end of Nemesis, what'd they do? Yes, uh, it was very cold. Was, they shook good hands. Good luck, yeah, shook hands, good luck. God, your endeavors. Right. And so we are led to believe that the adventures on the Enterprise E were going to continue on. Lore, uh, not lore, uh, B4 was there. Um, you know, the, things are getting back up and moving, moving on. Um, so Picard, in his 45 year uh, career in Starfleet, was aboard the Enterprise D for maybe about seven to eight years. 
Yeah. Uh, he was on the Stargazer. He served on this ship, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, so sure, so maybe those were some of the best years. But when the Enterprise D crash landed, as we remember in Generations, the, it was just like, let's, let me grab uh, my family album and beam out of here. Uh, just kick the dirt around the, the glass, the broken glass, and it's like, get, let's get out of here. And they'd just leave it there on the planet. He didn't care. It was very much the opposite of when Kirk watched the original Enterprise burn up in the atmosphere in Star Trek III. Uh, what have I done, Bones? Heartbreaking. Heartbreaking and emotional. What have I done, Bones? You did what you had to do. Jim. What you always do. What you always do. You give us a fighting chance in the face of death. Turn death into a fighting chance to live. <laughs> Turn death into a fighting chance to live. And then, and then there's beautiful music playing as the Enterprise just burns up. And that's the original OG Enterprise from, you know. And that broke my heart as a child. Kirk loved his ship. Picard found the ship as a means to an end. It yeah. was a thing to him. You never got the sense in Next Gen that he had an emotional bond to it. The audience does. Picard doesn't. Yeah. Picard should have said, oh, that painting, lovely painting. Riker crashed it on, on a planet. <laughs> but let me tell you about the Enterprise E that I commanded. What a ship that was. I, you know. It doesn't seem that wistful in, in, in this episode. He's getting ready to give the damn thing to Jordy. A, a little bit. A little bit. The show presents doesn't it. He, doesn't he say, I served on a lot of ships, but for some reason this He's is like, the one people remember? No, no. She says, she says, that was your first command. He's like, well, it wasn't my first, but it was the best. Oh, yeah, he does. You're right. Well, she wasn't the first, but she was certainly my favorite. And You're then, right. And then the camera pans, like, longingly over the, the painting and... The show treats it with the reverence the audience has for the ship, not so much the character, but that's okay. I'm going to give that a pass. <laughs> it becomes Trek 2 slash Trek 3. We, get, we, have, we have a different person doing the score. The old sc Jeff Russo, the old score guy, I think is out. Mm -hmm. There's a new guy doing it. It's weaving in themes, which I'm sure you've heard and recognize the themes from the movies, the motion pictures, that, that sense of adventure and excitement is there. Jean-Luc Picard, and if he wants to go on one more mission, that's what we're going to do. So Picard gets a, a secret coded message that's sent directly to his uh, TNG com badge in his, in his like stowed away in his suitcase. Uh, and then so he's like, uh, it's from Beverly Crusher and she says, trust no one. But uh, there's a secret code he has to decode it with. He trusts Riker, he meets Riker in a bar. They, they don't hug. <laughs> Appropriately. He calls him Jean-Luc, which is okay, because they've grown up, they're old men now. Yeah. He's, he's not as, he's not as uh, subordinate. He can call him Jean-Luc. Um, and the adventure begins. They have to get to a, a place to help Beverly Crusher. And Starfleet can't know about it, because trust nobody. Trust no one. It's got shades of uh, conspiracy, the, 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 the creatures in the mouth episode. Once again, though, we have an evil Starfleet, which is annoying. Presumably. Presumably. But a, 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 as long as they can give me something as entertaining as the old Star Trek movies, I'll still be okay. Well, um, the only evil Starfleet that's uh, recognized or personified is Captain Shaw. He's not even evil. No. And it's fine because I actually really like. He's him. like he's like Captain Jellico. I was gonna say 2.0. I guess, yeah, I guess yeah. He's like Captain Jellico 2.0. Get it done. He's just doing his fucking job, and these two assholes have gone out of ship trying to to get him to change his ways. And no, no, it's yeah. my ship. 
And, and I will really like Captain Shaw if he becomes a Captain Jellico. If he's a hard ass who's, who's mean, he's, he's very, very belittling and, and rude to them, um, but he runs a tight ship. And in the end, if he becomes like, like a neutral good guy where he, he does the right thing, he helps them out. Just a, just a good guy whose methods are different. Yes, when he realizes that there is an actual threat and Picard and Riker were correct or whatever, um, he, he, he helps out and he becomes a Captain Jellico who, went, who just had different methods of doing things, but in the end he was right. Yeah. And so I, I, I like that, uh, I, I would like for Shaw to have a complex depth to his character. They get in a little space pod, and they travel up to the, the beautiful space dock that... It, that we see in the motion pictures. I mean, they use that a bunch of times after that, sure. but it's definitely a reference to... Their subversion, or their secret mission, is very similar to uh, Kirk and crew stealing the Enterprise in Star Trek III, The Search for Spock. Yeah. Um, and it's, in, fact, it, in fact, the ship itself, did you catch the, the name of the Titan refit? No, Titan A. No, they, they, well, it might be the A, the A but they're calling it... Oh, uh, Constitution. The name of the refit, the, the class of the ship, is now the Neo-Constitution. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which, it, you know, the, the saucer section. It's basically the motion picture enterprise. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's yeah. a Neo-Constitution class. Yeah. yeah. Lots of references Lots to the, references. The, the movies, specifically. And, yes, we meet LaForge, uh, the daughter of Jordy LaForge. Is she the daughter or is she possibly the granddaughter at this point? No, Jordy's not that old. Okay, okay. But in real life, that's LeVar Burton's real daughter. Oh, never mind. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, her name's like M Micah? Z -Z 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 that's, yeah, Micah Burton. That's a neat detail, I will say. And her name's Sydney LaForge, which is also a member, Barry, because in All Good Things, how's your, how's Sydney? Sydney. Sydney. Yeah. Well, they're not so little anymore. How long has it been? Close to 25 years. 25 years. That'd be very interesting to side by side. I'm sure someone's done it on the internet, but side by side, I'm gonna do it myself. <laughs> side by side, all the, how they look now and how they made them look, because it's almost exactly age appropriate, time yeah. appropriate, um, how they made them look as older people in the last episode of Next Gen. And how they look now as actual older people. I think it's pretty close. It doesn't look as bad as when Kirk got old in the original series. <laughs> Do you remember that? They're, 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 the technology they were working with wasn't quite as good. Bones looked okay, but, but Kirk, uh, Kirk did turn into a big bloated uh, <laughs> space balloon. Uh, as neat. As what it is that LaForge's daughters are, it feels it's starting to feel like a really small universe. Oh, seven, there you are. Oh, look, Raffi's involved in this adventure. It's all the, the small number of people we know. But they're but just around here. It's a show, and you know, you got uh, they, they brought back seven and Raffi. I'm okay because Raffi's doing like some kind of spy mission. Should it, mention that it's something I'll forgive if the rest of the season is good. Sure. Yeah, I, I don't I don't mind that because um, there was a uh, oh yeah they did the same thing in uh, generations I think Sulu's daughter was the helmsman on um, Cameron Fry's Enterprise B yep uh, yep so so there, there's a, there's a you don't want to reference generations ever but there's <laughs> it's a fun thing it's a fun thing to do and it's it's neat in real life that that's his actual daughter they leave space dock. And I love it. I, I, I realize I'm probably being emotionally manipulated. Don't you care that he's manipulating you? Uh, I, I'm smart enough to realize that, but I'm okay with it because the, all the next gen films were just trash. Not very good. And if I were to jump from all good things to this. Yeah, yeah, that'd be fine. That'd be, be fine. fine. I'd be like, hey. This is great. What has everybody been up to for the last 48 years? I, I'm, I'm into it. And that, and that shot, the Constitution hull, like, and the Titan looks nice, and it's leaving the space dock. And 
you got that music, and you know when you leave the space dock, adventure awaits. <laughs> it's, it's Star Trek Three. <laughs> it's uh, uh, Star Trek Six. I seen Star Trek Six in the movie theaters, 91. Uh, I saw it like five or six times in the dollar show. I would watch it all the time in the dollar show. And there's a shot where they depart space dock. Captain Kirk says to, to um, Valeris, uh, Spock's protege, let's depart space dock, you know. And it's like, dun, 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 na, 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 na. But they have the shot. It's a POV shot. And the ship goes through the, the dock, right? Mm -hmm. Small screen, not so great. Big screen, it gave me chills. <laughs> <laughs> da, na, na, na. And you're in open space. It was exciting because you know you're going off on an adventure. And an interesting note about that, it's the very first clue that Kim Cattrall, uh, Lieutenant Valeris, is the conspirator. Which part was the clue? When they, when they pilot the ship right out of space dock. You know why? 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 Because they cut to her and she, she looks like emotional. She's, she's, she has, she has a, an air of, of wonderment and awe to her as she almost looks like, like this is amazing. I can't believe I'm witnessing this. Like this is awesome. Like just, just a titty bit. And it's like, I know you're a young Vulcan, but this is your response to that. <laughs> but she looks like, Mike. I await the adventure, and you're like, there's something wrong with that, Vulcan. Mike, you are, I bow to you, you are the superior Trekkie for, for catching that. Thank you. Thank I never, you. I never would have thought of that. It's, it's a repeat viewing kind of thing. Yeah. You know, in hindsight, I don't want to spoil Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country for anyone, but, um, but yeah, and, and it's, it's the subtlety of the direction, Nicholas Meyer's direction of of, yeah, just instead of cut. And I was looking for that in this, and I didn't find it. I just found like crew members just kind of like pressing buttons. So uh, that's okay, but, um, but I love that opening and they go on the adventure and I, I really, really like the scene when they first go to dinner with Shaw. And um, he he's started eating before them, <laughs> you know, like breaking, breaking um, all sorts of, politeness protocols yeah and Picard which says, is funny because he's super anal about everything else so he's just doing that to disrespect Picard and Riker really yeah. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely uh, he's very rude to them uh, he insults Picard's gift uh, the wine he's like I, I'm, a Mal I'm a Malbec man but thank you um, oh oh and Riker by the way I hate your fucking music yes yes for no good reason well, he's like, I had to purge the system of all your, your sloppy jazz music. <laughs> I prefer tempo and rhythm and, and order, you know. You're a little <laughs> freewheeling, loosey-goosey, uh, hippy-dippy Riker. And, um, and then he, he has a, a dark, deep, dark shot below the belt at Picard about the Borg. Former ex-Borg. That's enough, Captain. Uh, which is like, come on. I give, know. Give the guy a break. I know. It wasn't his f***ing fault. <laughs> But I'm assuming later on we're going to learn that Shaw's whole family was killed at Wolf 359 or something like that. It was okay when, when uh, they're gonna, Cisco... They're going to Benjamin Cisco that up? Yeah, it was okay when Cisco did it because it was like a week later. <laughs> you know? I think three years, two years, whatever. I think Picard saved the galaxy enough time since then that we can all just get beyond this. I suspect an imminent attack. Find the Red Lady. Do we do we have any speculations on the mysterious person that Raffi is texting? No. I did I did think that was neat, the the, the mystery aspect of refusing to have a, a voice or video communication. Sure, sure. So it's gonna have to be somebody we know, right? Is it gonna be is it gonna be Elnor? Elnor, I told you to stay on the ship. Yes. I didn't listen. 
<laughs> no, they're all fired. It's gonna be, it's gonna be Elnor, Mike. This is, remember, as, as happy as we've been, this is a Picard episode. You know, probably is gonna be lore. You're right, because they have to work Brent Spiner into I, this. I know lore is in it. Brent Spiner's playing lore, and he's probably a sub-villain who's manipulating the situation. We you you wanna you wanna end it you wanna end it epic we we have a, a we don't have a good villain really in Picard's past except for lore. Well, the lady Chris, uh, Amanda Plummer is supposed to be some kind of super. That could be that could be a fake out or sh that'll, that'll she'll be she'll will think she's the villain, and then by the time you get around to like episode. Four, five, no, whoops, it's lore. That's a decent speculation. Uh, this, I don't know, uh, Amanda Plummer certainly looks pretty evil. She's got a scar on her face and she looks really mad and she's like, John Luke, I'm gonna get you. Um, but we haven't watched it any more than episode one and episode one doesn't give you a lot of information. We, we haven't seen, I mean, it, it, there's a lot being forgiven just because this is episode one, but so far, we do not have a good villain. The, the bird face guys, no. They're pretty generic. Yeah. And I, I gotta be honest, a giant, I guess it's not that giant because Crusher, Crusher's ship is small, but that giant blatantly evil looking ship that warps in at the end is kind of like, eh. Thrilling. This is really exciting. We are being hunted. Very precise with your timing, Jean-Luc Picard. There's a lot of little little leads here that are very similar to seasons one and two, where it can go in multiple different directions. We did the same shit last time, mm -hmm. we speculate. Um, but so far the feel, this is mainly just a like a, a feelings and style kind of um, discussion. Yeah, I, I love the Star Trek two, three, four era tone, tone they're going with. The tone, the music, the retro ship, the, the sense of adventure. The characters kind of feel like the characters. The characters feel closer um, to what, the, what Riker and Picard should be in the future. Um, Picard is allowed to be a little um, uh, think, nostalgic about his his past. I mean, he, he's up there in he's up there in years. I don't know if his acting's quite as good as it was. It sounds a little flat to me. He's he's, he's old man. He's an old man. He's, old, he's got a little raspy old voice. And, yeah, uh, I'm okay with it. They're writing him better. I wish to God he wasn't a robot. What? I'm just it's gonna fine. ignore that. It, Even if it comes up, you can, I'm gonna ignore you can it. ignore that if you want. I'm I'm probably the I gotta be honest, I'm probably the only person on the face of the earth that doesn't really bother me that much. They do they do crazy shit in science fiction, and so he's got a robot body. All right. Oh, I don't know, Whatever. it bothers me. It's not the same Picard, it's a robot. It's, just, it's, just, it's, the same, it's the same mind, and that's the important thing. Is it? Yes. What about the soul? This is Star Trek, there is no soul. That shit's for Star Wars. I hope the villain isn't stupid, which is why I was kind of glad when you brought up Lore, because Lore always had potential, and that character never quite lived up to it. Yeah. Yeah. If they could finally do something worthy with Lore, that would be great. But it's going to be generic, angry space lady who wants revenge for something we never really saw on camera. I hope not. And that's gonna suck. I'm, well, Space Lady did do one thing. Did you catch the the Red Lady? Uh, Rachel Garrett, Enterprise C. Yeah, yeah okay. I caught that instantly. Uh, all right. <laughs> well, I didn't know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that was some uh, Starfleet installation somewhere that she, uh, presumably our villain, did uh, some kind of thing where it, it pulled it down. It did like a what is it? Who does the Oh, Doctor Strange. Oh, te teleport. Yeah, yeah. He, he does this. He, they, made a, they made a Doctor Strange hole, collapsed the building, and then another Doctor Strange hole opened and dumped it over <laughs> here. <laughs> Assumingly killing everyone on board. Uh, Rafi tried to stop it. She's like, 
There's something bad's gonna happen. I know it. I know it. Evacuate the building. And then she watched in horror as the building uh, was d destroyed. Uh, so we know um, uh, they gave a clue. Someone knew the clue. Maybe Laura. Uh, maybe somebody else knew the clue and, and transmitted it, Red Lady. Mm -hmm. And then Rafi did her spy work trying to figure out who Red Lady is and then narrowed it down to the statue honoring Rachel Garrett, a um, uh, Starfleet target. So, bad gal or guy or group. Presumably, and I haven't seen the trailer. I haven't even seen who you were saying is the bad gal yet. Oh, okay. Well, I'm glad you showed up to this discussion prepared. It's from, it's from the trailer. I'm reviewing the episode I saw. Okay. I'm not whatever. reviewing the. I'm not reviewing the fucking trailer. The trailer gives you some some things to think about. But listen, so from not, from here on out, I recognize that this could potentially be a story about someone or some group that wants revenge on Starfleet and will blow up things using a new technology called making Doctor Strange time portal holes and smashing things. And from here on out, I hope that's not the case, but I was happy so far with the first episode. I'm, I was glad, and I was, uh, appreciate the restraint of not having a huge space battle, which didn't happen in the opening. <laughs> uh, the only action that we got was Doctor Crusher having a phaser fight with Birdman. Yeah. We did not get a big battle. We got a threat at the end as the ship approached. End. Done with episode one. Fine. Here's here's where the here's where the bar is at. If they just have a fun space adventure that makes sense, and our characters are all written in character, I will be satisfied. I think it's incredibly satisfying. I agree with you. Uh, and, and it has a good send-off at the end, uh, akin to the last shot of um, All Good Things. Mm -hmm. A nice send-off. I don't know if they need to kill off any characters. I suppose it doesn't matter at this point. It'll be sad if they do. But um, if, they, if they have a good send-off for the TNG cast that's better than Nemesis, which ended on a downer, <laughs> um, I'll be happy. I'll be happy. And I can, I can pretend that... We just, we jumped from 1994 to 2023 in terms of the next generation canon timeline. Yeah. We'll we'll ignore all the feature films. We'll just say the Enterprise was quietly decommissioned. Um, <laughs> and especially seasons one and two. Of the Enterprise Picard. D is in a, is in a sh uh, fleet museum uh, where where little kids are going on tours for their school, <laughs> looking at where Captain Picard sat for all of the adventures of. Enterprise D, and uh, I'll be happy. Thrilling. Just pretending. <laughs> what do they call it, head cannon, right? Yeah. 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 I'll just uh, eliminate all those features. There's some good things about the features, but they're not good. You'll edit out of your head 25 years worth of worthless content? Yeah. Yeah. I always felt like there wanted to be one more movie after Nemesis, a okay. wrap up a sort of the, the next gen's version of Undiscovered Country. So Rich, when we return, uh, I don't know if we're gonna do two episodes or three episodes. Uh, two or three, chunk, we'll do it in chunks. In chunks, yeah, cause, cause when you get past like two or three episodes, then it becomes too much to talk about in we're one Probably gonna show. say repetitive shit. Yeah, so not have uh, much to say about one episode. But uh, I think we're we're gonna be in this for the long haul, everybody, for good or bad. Um, whether it goes downhill or continues to get better, we don't know yet. But we're gonna give you our honest, uh, truthful opinions about what we're what we're watching, and with with a little bit of um, with a little bit of of clarity, I think this time because I think you and I have both become. Uh, accepting, <laughs> resigned, resigned <laughs> of what what that new track is dark and miserable and every starship looks exactly the same, the bridge, um, which I'm not happy about. We we're, we don't get our brightly lit, colorful, comfortable Star Trek sets anymore with carpet. And everything's dark and shiny and looks like the bridge of a Star Destroyer, <laughs> which I think is ugly and gross, and I don't like the look of any new Trek stuff. Um, we're resigned with that. 
we're going to hope to God we get a, a really nice, long, next-generation action-adventure movie that stays true to the characters, where the overarching plot line isn't dumb and or insulting, and it has a solid conclusion. That's the best we can hope for. Um, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna do it. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna trek through this season. I'm gonna go fix that. I'm gonna go home. Thrilling.